The only thing you need to know to understand the deepest metaphysical secrets is this, that for every outside there is an inside and for every inside there is an outside. And although they are different, they go together. There is, in other words, a secret conspiracy between all insides and all outsides. And the conspiracy is this, to look as different as possible and yet underneath to be identical. Because you don't find one without the other. Like Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. Note that, agreed. So there is a secret. What is esoteric, what is profound and what is deep is what we will call the implicit. What is obvious and on the open is what we will call the explicit. And I and my environment, you and your environment are explicitly as different as different could be. But implicitly you go together. And this is discovered by the scientist when he tries as the whole art of science is to describe what happens exactly. And when he describes exactly what you do, he finds out that you, your behavior, is not something that can be separated from the behavior of the world around you. He realizes then that you are something that the whole world is doing. Just as when the sea has waves on it, well, right, the sea, the ocean is waving. And so each one of us is a waving of the whole cosmos, the entire works, all there is. And with each one of us, it's waving and saying, you, here I am. <laughs> Only it does it differently each time because variety is the spice of life. But you see, the funny thing is, we haven't been brought up to feel that way. Instead of feeling that we, each one of us, are something that the whole realm of being is doing, we feel that we are something that has come into the whole realm of being as a stranger. When we were born, we don't really know where we came from, because we don't remember. And we think when we die, that's just going to be that. There's a line in Garp that you say you can look at the arc of your life and find it interesting. That's, I mean, that's what it's been for me. It's nice that it has been getting better and better. That's the only thing I pull, of, uh, pull out of it. I mean, that's nice that it keeps trying. And the fact that I'm offered these amazing things to keep to keep doing stuff that keeps exploring different aspects. That's wonderful, too. The first movie was Popeye. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you remember, the opening scene is Robin in a rowboat in a storm. And I was just, here's this huge screen at Chinese theater in uh, Los Angeles. And I thought, that's Robin, my little boy Robin. Look at him. <laughs> Eat your heart out, world. Here he comes. <laughs> Performing and doing all these things, we never acknowledge anything negative. Where it's, and if you do, it gets very violent, like the time, mm -hmm. what happens immediately after the scene you just saw is, he starts to confront who you are. So mm -hmm. you, I know who you are, and he, get, he would have really hurt Jeff's character if he'd gone any further. Yeah. And that's why he goes, the hallucination guards against that. It's basically, it is freeing to create that character, because yeah, you can really so. explore kind of where you've been and the aspects of why you would want to deny and that kind of whole mm -hmm. aspect of, you know, performing for the sake of just avoiding. For him, love is such a delicate thing that if, and even getting it back again, triggers another one of the breakdowns. Uh -huh. It's so fragile for him, and that's what makes it interesting. That's why I did it. There's a sadness, and then you have to go, there's also hope. I mean, a sadness, it's always like, yeah, you, know, you wish they hadn't happened, but they did. And the purpose is to make you different. It's what they call a Buddhist gift. I would call it the ultimate Christian gift. It's that idea of, you're back and you realize the thing that matters are others, way beyond yourself. Self goes away. Ego, bye-bye. You're not easy on yourself in this show, are you? No. 
you know, as an alcoholic, I talk about, you know, some warning signs, you know, like DUIs in a cul-de-sac, things like that. The idea of, you know, have you been through it to talk about it and see, like, you know, this is what you go through, heart surgery, you know, alcoholism. I went to rehab in wine country just to keep my options open. You know, these are things you got to talk about. You want to talk about it? No. Why is there such a heavy, heavy-duty problem with drugs? That addresses the psychology of a nation. That's why I talk about it. You try and tell people you do it. Just say no. No, just say Noriega. No, beyond that, it is something much, much deeper. And yes, you're right. There is something wrong. But people are slowly waking up. The time is over for just sitting going, it'll be taken care of. And I try to address it in, using the only weapon I have, comedy. And that's all we do. And I hope people wake up. And they are. We ask for your help. And we'll try and help from this end. And we'll meet. And there will be a kinder, gentler nation one day. Thank you. And we all have a great need for acceptance. But you must trust that your beliefs are unique, your own, even though others may think them odd or unpopular, even though the herd may go, that's bad. <laughs> I don't envision myself as a teacher or as a, I can't proselytize to people even when we talk about drugs or anything. I just, you just have to, I, I'm a player. And in mm -hmm. the sense of just in the process of playing, you can talk about some interesting things, mm -hmm. you know, it, that there's things that, you know, why we've evolved to, you know, to make that connection, to go on, to, to do amazing things to and and that moment talked about this once that there is a, a thing when you create when you find that little tiny flash when you find some it's like idea bliss. it's what it's bliss well, because the brain gives you the same reinforcement that right. it does with sex I mean, that's right and the reason the brain gives you a little hit of endorphin when you create is just to keep you going here's a taste yes keep creating you get another taste because uh -huh. you're only given a little spark of madness and if you lose that nothing basically when you're really firing and it really works it's like musicians have said it or writers say it it's just you're just channeling it's truly that that's why you say that divine inspiration where it just passes you're just letting it through you i just wanted to ask robin real quick about what's his favorite type of movie in terms of ones that make social impacts or ones that are fun loving like aladdin for example they both, I mean, I, I love doing both of them because I think in their own way, they both have some effect. I remember people coming up after Aladdin and saying, you know, it was such a great thing that they could sit with their kid and laugh mm -hmm. as much as their child. That I think is a great thing. It's like, you know, Sullivan's Travels where you see people just having a wonderful time, especially in times like this. Mm -hmm. Why well, also, why you do a movie is to learn, to expand yourself, to push yourself. It was like Peter Weir when I did Dead Poet Society. He, he said the power of silence, that he said, you don't have to do anything and make a point. And, or the, the power of thought. But, you know, you learn something and you make a movie, which is a double bill. Yeah. And you get paid. It's, but it's, I mean, that, if the truth is, if they knew it, I'd probably do it for much less. <laughs> I don't know how much value I have in this universe, but I do know that I made a few people happier than they would have been without me. And as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever need to be. I mean, you know, some movies you do for money, and those are the dangerous ones. Mm. Old dogs, we'll talk later. <laughs> the idea that you do those and you go, and you know why you're making them. It's a kid's comedy, you know it's gonna be silly and you know that's gonna be up for grabs. But with something like World's Greatest Dad, it's like, no, you do it as a labor of love and you do it with friends who you feel like you can do it with and say, hey, we're both in this together. And that's kind of wonderful. They're all done with this kind of love. You know, you, 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 you commit to it and you go, whatever happens, I'm in, I'm proud. That's always what I want to do, yeah. is to try different things and kind of always change perceptions. And, and change the rhythm. You can... Yeah, break up. It's, it is a rhythm. It's basically saying, okay, now we hit it, you know, there, and then, you know, hit a little harder and then back off and then go berserk, like, you know, with the, the stand-up, which is just free form, and then come back and play something so controlled, like a one-hour photo. Those are all possible. And having that, that range really helps. For me, it's great. And but having great friends and family that yeah. just make life extraordinary. And a world... <laughs> to still go out and see and learn about, which is yeah. the most important of all. Just look at your own life and just realize what, what things are precious to you. That's what I did when I was doing it. You know, I would come home and just realize how extraordinary that there is, you have heaven in front of you. That idea that you have, look around and see the precious things, the connection with family, friends, you know, the, the, the things in your, and the people, especially in your life. My kids are extraordinary. Did they go through rough times? Yeah, but you come out the other side and I go, God, they're so amazing. I'm just, I'm so blessed. I would hope that there would be, if there's enough to life, that would have the places that I, or at least a version of the places I've grown that I think are extraordinary here. 
mountains, lakes, forests, beaches with perfect curl. Um, but also, I mean, a place almost like Venice. Where, I mean, there's times in Venice to me, I've been there when I just go, my God, what a glorious city. And, and even New York in spring where you can go, there's times in every different place that you've been where you say, this is, this is paradise or this is extraordinary. I would hope that there'd be something like that. And most of all, I would hope you'd come in contact with extraordinary people like the ones I've met in life. The powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? think your legacy will be? God knows. I don't know. They had a thing recently where they showed a clip of all the HBO specials I did and it was like going, I'm still alive. Why are they doing this? I don't know what my legacy is. Is that it? I mean, that I had a good time and I think also that I've tried different things throughout my career and I hope to keep doing that and to keep working with interesting people. Make your life spectacular. I know I did. Just keep going. Find that thing you love because it's tough work. Uh, and my father gave me this advice when I said I wanted to be an actor. He said, have a backup profession like welding. But I think if you can find that thing that really gives you joy, that'll be it. Because uh, for me, it's always been comedy and stand-up and, and acting too because of exploring behavior. But it's tough work. But it's, and if you can get it, even better. Realize there are a lot, a lot of amazing people out there to be grateful for. And a loving God. And that, other than that, Good luck. That's what life is about. All I can do is to talk about what is. It amuses me to talk about what is because it's wonderful. I love it, and therefore I like to talk. So this is not on a, you see, this is the whole approach here is not to convert you not to make you over, not to improve you, but for you to discover that if you really knew the way you are, things would be, would be sane. But you see, you can't do that. You can't make that discovery because you're in your own way. You can't control your thoughts you can't control your feelings because there is no controller. You are your thoughts and your feelings. And they're running along, running along, running along. Just sit and watch them. There they go. You're still breathing, aren't you? Still growing your hair? Still seeing and hearing? Are you doing that? I mean, is, is breathing something that you do? <laughs> Do you see, I mean, do you organize the operations of your eyes? And know exactly how to work those rods and cones in the retina? Do you do that? It's a happening. It happens. So you can feel all this happening. Your breathing is happening. Your thinking is happening. Your feeling is happening. Your hearing, your seeing. The clouds are happening across the sky. The sky is happening blue. The sun is happening shining. There it is, all this happening. And may I introduce you? This is yourself. This begins to be a vision of who you really are. And that's the way you function. You function by happening, that is to say, by spontaneous occurrence. It may sound like a lofty thing to say, but basically, you know, what are we doing on this planet? And I think through the Beatle experience that we'd had, we'd grown so many years within a short period of time. I'd experienced so many things and met so many people, but I realized there was nothing actually that was giving me a buzz anymore. I think fame is a good thing in terms of giving you uh, heightened experience or, or at least more experience and um, but then it's what you do with that or what what that uncovers I think for me you know as I say I realize I want to you know I just want more this isn't it this isn't it you know 
Um, fame is not the goal. Money, you know, although money is nice to have, it can buy you a bit of freedom. You know, you can go to the Bahamas when you want, but it doesn't, it's not the answer. And the answer, you know, is um, how to get peace of mind and how to be happy. That's really what we're supposed to be here for. And uh, the difficult thing is that we all go through our lives and through our days and we don't experience bliss and you know it's a very subtle thing and uh, to experience that and to be able to know how to do that is uh, something you don't just stumble across you've got to search for it did you experience bliss on stage or in the studio um in a way did performing it put you in touch with with that with that bliss well we had happiness at times and you know not the kind of bliss i mean where every atom of your body is just buzzing you know because it's again it's beyond the mind it's like you know it's it's when there's no thought involved that i mean it's it's a pretty tricky thing to try to um <coughs> to get to that stage because it means controlling the mind and being able to transcend the relative states of consciousness waking sleeping dreaming which is all we we really know uh, but there is another state that um, goes beyond all that, and it's in that state that's where, you know, the bliss and the knowledge, uh, you know, that that's available is. You know, I get confused when I look around at the world and I see everybody's running around, and you know, as Bob Dylan said, "He not busy being born is busy dying," and yet nobody's trying to figure out. What's the cause of death? And what happens when you die? I mean, that to me is the only thing really that's of any importance. The rest is all secondary. Do you think pop musicians are afraid to <clears throat> deal with subjects that are so big or it just doesn't occur to them? Or do people think, oh, it's not commercial enough? Who wants to talk about life itself? I don't know what anybody else thinks. And, um, you know, as the years have gone by, I seem to have found myself more and more out on a limb as far as you know that kind of thing goes i mean even close friends of mine you know they maybe don't want to talk about it because they don't understand it but i believe in the thing that i read years ago which i think was in the bible it said knock and the door will be opened and it's true if you want to know anything in this life you just have to knock on the door whether that be some physically on somebody else's door and ask them a question or which I was lucky to find is the meditation is you know it's all within because if you think about it there isn't anything I mean in creation the whole of creation that <clears throat> is perfect you know there is nothing that goes wrong with nature only what man does then it goes wrong but we are made of that thing the very essence of our being, of every atom in our body, is made from this perfect knowledge, this perfect consciousness. But superimposed on that is through, if I can use the word, the tidal wave of bull that goes through the world. It's cable, you can say that. Yeah. So there's this, we're being barraged by, um, you know, by bull. But not only that, the way the world is structured or the way creation is structured, we have duality, which says yes, no, good, bad, loss, gain, birth, death. And it's a, this circle that you get trapped in. It's like the Memphis blues again. And that's the hardest thing to, <clears throat> to understand what is causing um, both of these things. What's causing day and night, good and bad. It's all the, the cause and this is the effect. So. I mean, we're getting really transcendental here, but well, to no, say I, that it, our our physical being is really um, on a very, very subtle level. It's just like the sap in a tree mm -hmm. is is the sap and it runs throughout all the parts of the tree. Now, it's like that. Our bodies are manifesting into physical bodies, but the cause of the sap is pure consciousness, pure awareness. And that is perfect and perfect knowledge. But we have to tap into that to understand it. You know, in, in England, you always get, um, as far as I was concerned, the left, the center and the right, they're all really the same. They're all different shades of the same grayness. And although it's a long shot, 
you know, Maharishi tried to get these people formed together into a party which would be called the Natural Law Party, which was um, the same Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And the idea behind it really is to have consciousness as the basic thing because really you know we get in government or we get in any situation in life we get the reflection of our own consciousness we can't really complain about what we have because that is us it's a reflection of our our own being now if we could have um, people who are actually conscious in a spiritual sense then all the underlying problems to society, I mean, it wouldn't be able to change just overnight, but over a generation or two generations, you could have things where, for instance, say in England, and I'm sure it's the same here, you get disease. So you've got a lot of expenditure on hospitals and on fixing up people who have disease. Now, the problem is that most doctors, they study disease. They don't know about health. So you'd need to reprogram stuff so that you p teach people about how to be healthy. That way, you don't spend so much money on, on disease. You'd have, people would be healthier. You wouldn't have such a you know, requirement for you know, all, this, all the various things that take up all the money. You'd be able to use that money for something else. So the natural law that operates on this planet or in the universe Everything, as I said earlier, everything works in a perfect order. And there's a scheme to things which has a certain intelligence that drives it and makes everything work. Now, if we as individuals could go to that level of consciousness where we can bring it into our being, and as Maharishi Mahesh Yogi once said, for a forest to be green, each tree must be green. So it's no use just one or two people being, you know, like this. You'd have to make the whole of society, if they had that understanding. And that's what I think, really, you'd have to, you know, school people. Um, right from being children, teach people about their health, about their bodies, about consciousness, because it's all to do with consciousness. Raise the level of consciousness, and then everything automatically becomes better. Do you think it can happen, or do you think people are totally on autopilot too much? It, it can happen, but... It's something which will take a long, long time, generations of people. I mean, if you look now, just through, say, from the 60s or the 50s, um, there's a lot more people, thanks to, say, Indian music, thanks to rock and roll music, uh, who have got much more understanding. You go out there on the street now, you can find Indian spice shops, Indian restaurants, and places to go for yoga, for meditation. There's a much higher awareness, generally, uh, on those kind of things. And so it is seeping through. I mean, where did all the really good hippies go when they all dropped out? I think a lot of them are, you know, have, you know, brought up, there's probably two generations of kids now who are much more um, open to that type of consciousness. And they've been brought up by, you know, being vegetarian or whatever that helps the society become, you know, much more um, balanced. That's, it's all to do with the balance, you know, we've got too much extreme going on. You're optimistic. You have to be optimistic, yeah. You know, yeah. it is getting better and worse because that's the nature of relativity. You know, good and bad, good and bad. But the individual, you know, if the individual gets um, that consciousness, then it doesn't matter because in a way you can retain the balance between the good and the bad. You know, because really, good and bad are the same. Um, they are. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. So it's like in the middle is the safe, safe um, path. The biggest ego trip going is getting rid of your ego. And the joke of it all is your ego doesn't exist. <laughs> There's nothing to get rid of. It's an illusion. I don't exist. So uh, they're all characters that I've played. Jim Carrey was a less uh, intentional character. Right because I thought I was just building something that people would like, but it was a character.
the cautionary voice was my ego trying to protect, protect itself, itself against an assault and that I was about to mount on it. Looking for Jim Carrey again and having trouble finding him. And at a certain point, I, I realized, hey, wait a second, you know, if it's so easy to lose Jim Carrey, who the hell is Jim Carrey? But you still want to ask how to stop the illusion. Now, who's asking? And the big difficulty is this. I want to find a method whereby I can change my consciousness. But the, therefore, to improve myself. But the, the self that needs to be improved is the one that is doing the improving. And so I'm rather stuck. Well, what is it that you feel when you feel I? What do you do when somebody says, pay attention? What is uh, the difference between looking at something and taking a hard look at it? Or between hearing something and listening intently? What's the difference? What's the difference between waiting while something goes on and enduring it? Why? The difference is this, that when you pay attention, instead of just looking, you screw up your face, you frown and stare. That is a muscular activity around here. When you will, you grit your teeth or clench your fists. When you endure or control yourself, you pull yourself together physically and therefore you get uptight. You hold your breath. You do all kinds of muscular things to control the functioning of your nervous system. And none of them have the slightest effect on the proper operation of the nervous system. Why don't we just stop them? Why don't we get tough, take to the streets in millions, say enough is enough? It's an expression of my view, which is that we, human beings, all have a responsibility to stand up in solidarity with one another against authority that is errant, wherever and however and whatever it is and wherever we see it. Errant authority. You know, this is not 60s bull. This is stuff that has to do with the reality of the way the world turns now and the way it works. And we, and we by and large, have a very blinkered view of it. Do you think that still has traction? Absolutely. Is it my imagination? Is it too much to suggest that their leaders over there and our leaders in the West are driven not by trying to achieve peace in our time, but by something else, by something altogether less sublime? Call me a cynic, but it sometimes seems to me that some of them are more attached to power than to peace. You are not still in a democracy. You can buy political power now. That is not democratic. At some point in everybody's life, they have to decide whether or not they believe in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Paris. If you do, either you believe in it or you don't. You can't have it both ways. And so if you do believe it, then you have to stand up for people's human rights all over the world, irrespective of their ethnicity or their religion or their nationality. We're all human beings and we behave differently by accidents of our birth. The walls that divide us are created accidentally, and in consequence, they are reversible. Once we understand that they're only like us, we're just people who are born in different parts of the world. We don't have collateral damage anymore. We no longer allow the headlong rush to maximize the bottom line. We say that other things that are more important. Wish You Were Here is about that the world is a confusing place, and that uh, it's difficult to find a reality that one can grasp wholeheartedly. The thing that I attach to most powerfully in my life is my humanity and that of other people. We've got to talk about your tour because it's, it's, it's called Us and Them. And that's, that's a, a title that is very well known because it's one of your uh, classics. 
Yeah. Um, why is it relevant now? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a song from Dark Side of the Moon, which was from 1973. There's a line in it which goes, um, with, without, and who'll deny that's what the fighting's all about. And the answer to that question is almost everybody. Almost everybody thinks that the wars that we are subject to constantly now, we live in a state of perpetual war, which by a lot of people in the United States has been accepted. They think it's okay because they think they're fighting terrorists. That's what they think. It, that's not what it, that's not why we're in a state of perpetual warfare, in my view. And we know that all human beings are descended from the first Homo sapiens and who were from Africa, and that we have spread out over the globe into different parts of the globe. And in consequence, we all, some of us look different than others. This is because of weather and you know, different <laughs> stuff that's happened over the last time. But we all carry the same DNA. We, were, we are all related one to another. Wherever we're born, whatever our religion is, whatever our ethnicity, whatever our color, whatever our sexual preference is, whatever, we are brothers and sisters. And that, so that's why. This is what I've learned, all right? I've learned that shame is a terrible motivator. I was crippled by insecurity and, and feelings of shame when I was a 15-year-old boy. Are you nostalgic? No, what, for those days? No. Yeah. I'm looking forward. I'm, as I say to my partner in life now, I say it to her often, I, we keep dinning it into each other, really, is that we have to stay in the moment. You have to stay as close to the moment as you can. And, you know, not worry too much about yesterday. Um, look forward to tomorrow, but make certain that in the moment you're looking into their eyes and that, and that you're focused on love. I, I know it sounds soppy, but it's not. One would need to persuade the good people of the United States of America that they somehow need to wrest the power that resides uh, with the very, very wealthy back to the rest of you or the rest of them in order that you could, for instance, have a mainstream media that reports news from around the world rather than providing um, 24 hour entertainment in order to sell soap powder, which is, which is with all due respect, and it, there's not a great deal of respect you can give to even, even some of the considered august bodies, some of the broadsheets, you know, the New York Times is now just a mouthpiece for the government, so is the Wall Street Journal. So, so um, but the, the people would have to wait, first of all, First of all, they would have to wake up, the people, you Americans, would have to wake up to the fact that these newspapers and the rest of the media are not giving you the news. Thank you.